have now um, two uh, lectures about uh, spatial transcriptomics, which is a very fascinating um, technology. And the first talk will be uh, by Michaela Ast, who is just right now finishing her PhD mm -hmm. on this topic. So looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Right. Yes, so my name is Michaela, um, and as Eva said, I'm a PhD candidate in Joachim Lundeberg's group at SciLife Lab in Stockholm. I'm about to finish my PhD in uh, one and a half months. So um, during these five years, I've been working with uh, a technology called spatial transcriptomics that I will tell you a little bit about today. Um, oh, did you? Oh, so I should. Okay. All right, so the outline uh, of the lecture today will be that I will first give you um, an introduction into transcriptomics and to spatially resolve transcriptomics. And then next I will tell you about the spatial transcriptomics technology, um, which will be the, the main focus on this lecture. And then lastly, if we have uh, more time, I will tell you about the study on human heart development where we applied spatial transcriptomics. So, some introduction to spatially resolved transcriptomics. Um, so, when you study gene expression or transcriptomics, many use the, uh, something that we refer to as standard RNA sequencing. So, when you do, what you do is that you take a piece of biopsy um, and you homogenize it and you extract all the RNA molecules from that particular biopsy and then you analyze them jointly. So this means that you get an average representation of all the genes that are uh, expressed within that tissue. So you will lose the spatial information of where particular genes are expressed within the tissue. Um, and some genes that are also quite lowly expressed risk the fact of being diluted as noise. So another way to analyze gene expression, since we know um, that most tissues are heterogeneous, is to do single cell RNA sequencing, as Alexandra told us about this morning. Um, and, um, but there is still something missing. It is a spatial component. Um, because some of the genes are expressed all over the tissue, whilst other genes are expressed at certain places within the tissue. And if you know the spatial information of where certain genes are expressed, we could get more insight into tumor heterogeneity, for example. And also um, looking at uh, gene expression patterns um, through differentiation of um, uh, organisms and, um, um, and uh, organs. All right, so there are a number of uh, experimental and computational methods um, that has been established today um, that aim to combine spatial or the positional information uh, with gene expression data. And I will tell you some uh, about some of these existing technologies. So one way of uh, looking at spatial gene expression is simply by um, isolating regions of interest within a particular tissue and then extract those, uh, the RNA from that particular region and analyze it. Uh, and one of these technologies is laser capture microdissection. So what you do is basically that you use a laser beam to cut out the region of interest. Um, so this is a quite robust technology, but it's very laborious and um, so it's not that high throughput. Another way to do it is to use a technology called TOMOSIC. So here you use, um, this is a cryosectioning approach where you use the biological samples and then you cryosection it and then you analyze each of these cryosections individually. So if you use three identical biological samples, so for example like model organisms, like here they use a zebrafish, um, and you cryosection these into um, all of the three main axes um, of the body, uh, you could computationally create a 3D transcriptional map, transcriptional map um, of um, the embryo. 
Um, another way uh, is to use TIVA. Um, this is the only technology that can analyze uh, spatial gene expression in live tissue. So you use um, a TIVA tag, it's called, and you, they, um, they penetrate into cells of live tissue. And then you activate specific cells that you are interested in. Uh, and when you activate them, this TIVA tag will automatically uh, bind to the mRNAs within the cells. And then you can extract those cells or those gene expression and analyze it. Um, it's quite low throughput because you cannot um, analyze that many cells in parallel. And then there's another way to do it, which is um, niche sick, it's called. Um, so here you use transgenic animals that um, express photoactivity um, yeah, gene um, GFP, green fluorescent protein. Um, so you basically intravenously uh, transfer some uh, landmark um, cells into the, to the animal. So here they transfer T and B cells. And then you photoactive, um, and then you activate some areas that are of, of a specific niche. And then you cell sort these cells based on their express, uh, the expression of GFP. Um, instead of extracting RNA uh, from particular regions, you can also visualize them directly in their tissue context. Um, so this is referred to as in situ hybridization technologies. Um, so some of these, uh, one of these technologies is single molecule fish. So here you basically hybridize shorter probes uh, onto different regions uh, of a transcript, and then you visualize it um, in the in the in the cell, um, and this is a quantitative uh, uh, measurement. So you can actually count how many how how many uh, molecules um, that are expressed within the cell, and this is a um, very sensitive uh, technology, but. You can only analyze a few genes at a time. So there are more multiplex technologies, for example, SeqFish, um, where you do sequential hybridization of uh, these single molecule probes. Um, so you do sequential rounds of hybridization and then imaging and then stripping off the, the probes and then you do another round of um, hybridization. And then you get the sort of a, a color pattern and can distinguish what gene it is. And this is the same for mirrorfish, another technology. Um, but here you only hybridized uh, the probes once to the target. Um, uh, and these probes contain a flanking region, uh, which can then be, uh, which are used as the readout, um, readout sequence. So you can do sequential rounds of hybridization of these readout probes. Um, and then signal extinction, and then another round of, um, um, of probe hybridization. So if you have any questions, please stop me and ask. All right, um, you can also do sequencing directly in the tissue. So the first in situ sequencing technology um, was used by using padlock probes. Um, so in this approach, you reverse transcribe all the mRNAs within the cell, and then you target uh, a padlock probe to the cDNA uh, of interest in, in the cells. Um, these padlock probes are single-stranded DNA molecules. So either they have a gap between their ends or they are adjacent to each other. So uh, in the gap um, probe probe, uh, you, you, you fill this gap with um, DNA polymerization and then you ligate the ends so that you create a DNA circle. So this DNA circle is then amplified into um, a product that is called a DNA nanoball. Um, and this nanoball contains a lot, a lot of uh, copies of the originating um, um, pellet probe that can then be sequenced. Um, but as Alexandra told us this morning, um, when you do cDNA, uh, when you do reverse transcription, that is a very critical step um, in, the, in where you lose a lot of material. So there are some approaches that where you actually target 
the RNA instead of the cDNA. Um, so this can be done by using another probe that is, um, that is ligated um, next to the padlock probe. So this is called a snail product or a snail probe, probably because it looks a little bit like a snail. And only when these two are close to each other, um, this circuit can be ligated. And then you do rolling circuit amplification again. So both of these targets or both of these methods are targeted approaches, but there are also uh, transcriptome-wide approaches uh, for in situ sequencing. So one of these are called uh, one of these methods is called FISEC, uh, where you use a random uh, hexamer primer to um, uh, reverse transcribe uh, mRNAs in the cell. Um, and then instead of ligating the actual um, the padlock probe, you circularize the, the cDNA instead. And then you amplify that product and you can in the end visualize where certain genes are expressed. But because um, it can be a little bit problematic to analyze all transcript all the transcripts in, in cells uh, due to overcrowding um, and overlapping of fluorescent signals. So this technology has a little bit lower um, sensitivity than other methods. So yes. Mm -hmm. what, what, what number of genes can you... So what number of genes? So, um, so with this, uh, this approach, um, around 30 genes, um, or at least what they, what they um, have in their paper, um, I think here they, wow, no, I don't remember, but I think it's more than, um, it's more than 30 genes. Um, but, um, so yeah, so it's around it's around thirty genes for the, the target approach. And there are there meerfish. So for meerfish, yes, sorry. Um, so for single molecule fish, it's maybe up to five, maybe. Um, and seek fish and meerfish is around hundred and a little bit more. Yeah. Mm. Yes. So you can also com there are also computational ways of constructing. Construct, yes? Sorry, mm -hmm. go back mm -hmm. to the last paper. So this, um, why did you mention fluorescent signal? So this is about mm -hmm. sequencing, right? So yes. Where does the fluorescence come in? Um, it's because when you do sequencing, you use something called sequencing by ligation um, in these approaches. So the sequencing probe um, or the decoding probe is attached to a fluorophore. So that is the way you, uh, you read out the sequence. So one color represents um, a certain nucleotide. Sorry, yes, yes, exactly. All right, so there are also computational ways of um, constructing spatially resolved gene expression data. Um, and all of this technology starts with dissociated single cells. Um, and then you computationally assign a spatial position um, based on a reference uh, gene expression map. So there are two methods um, that use this, um, this type of approach. One of them is called Surat. Uh, and the other one, it doesn't really have a name, but both of them, they used um, they use single cell data and then they assigned um, a spatial position to, of these cells uh, based on a reference map. So what they did is that they um, computationally divided the, um, the tissue into several parts or bins. And then they gave each of these bins a certain score based on if the gene was expressed or not expressed there um, compared to the, the reference database. So the reference database in this case is um, in situ hybridization databases. Yes, so there are also um, more recently developed methods called DISMAP, for example, um, where they um, looked at dissociated Drosophila embryos and constructed virtual embryos from that. All right. Um, in situ capturing technologies, this is where I put uh, spatial transcriptomics. Um, so, so it's more like co capturing and barcoding the whole transcriptome in situ, and then do the sequencing ex situ. So in the spatial transcriptomics technology, we capture 
um, gene expression from tissue section onto barcoded microarrays. And then um, we sequence all of these and trace them back to their spatial origins. And I will tell you more about this technology uh, soon. Okay, so all of these technologies have their advantages and disadvantages. So um, let's first have a look at single cell RNA sequencing. Um, so it's a transcriptome-wide approach um, with a detection efficiency around 40 or 20, 5 to 40%. Most papers refer to it as 10%. Um, but yeah, this technology does not have spatial, um, uh, spatial information. So all the dissection technologies, um, they have a high throughput, um, like not high through, high resolution, um, and they can all be transcriptome wide, um, and then they are analyzed either by RNA sequencing and single cell RNA sequencing. But laser capture micro dissection can be um, very labor intensive um, and has low throughput. And Tomasic. Um, you, you usually need identical biological samples to create this 3D transcriptional map. TIVA technology, um, it has low throughput. And niche technology, you need actually transgenic animals. Um, and the exact position within the niche that you analyze, uh, you cannot um, order the, the single cells within that niche, even though you can analyze a lot, a lot of the uh, cells at the same time. So in situ hybridization technologies, all of them even have subcellular resolution. Uh, but all of them are also targeted, so that means you need to know the, the genes beforehand. Um, single molecule fish has a uh, efficient or a detection efficiency of nearly 100%. Um, so many newer technologies usually use single molecule fish to uh, verify their own um, sensitivity. But it has a low target throughput. And with the higher throughput technologies, Seekfish and Mirfish, um, usually you need specialized equipment, um, like a super resolution microscopy, in order to distinguish the different, the different genes. And the in situ sequencing technologies, uh, they also have subcellular resolution. But uh, padlock probe approach is, is targeted, and the FISEC has a very low sensitivity. And lastly, the spatial transcriptomics technology. Um, it is a transcriptome-wide approach, um, though at the moment um, it's not single cell resolution. All right, so that was an overview of some spatial technologies. Do you have any questions? I'm sorry, yeah? can you translate, uh, it seems obvious, but I want to ask, can you mm -hmm. translate the subcellular into Yes. Can you use those methods so on a cellular level? You mean what's the difference between cellular no, and sub? I mean, if we have, for example, a marfish, it's a subcellular method, but can I use it to uh, on a cellular level also? On um, on like on in on cell culture, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. Mm. Through, yeah. Yes. All right. Um, so, okay. Yeah, sorry, you want me to when go back? You, mm? When you say anatomical features, mm. what does it exactly Yes, mean? so uh, when I say anatomical features here and here, it means that uh, in Tomosik, so you have cryo sections in all the different directions. Um, it doesn't certainly mean that that particular pixel or uh, voxel or what, whatever you will create afterwards will have the size of a single cell, but it will be. Um, it will um, correlate to a specific part of the tissue. Um, and the same is with spatial transcriptomics. Anatomical feature is that it's not uh, a, a single cell, it's more you, um, it's more- How many cells does it correspond to typically? In, in spatial transcriptomics, it's around 10 to 40 cells, depending on if, like where, where in the tissue you look at and what, what type of tissue. Yeah, I will show you um, more of that soon. All right, so let's dig a little bit deeper into the spatial transcriptomics technology. Um, this technology was published in July 2016, um, and I will show you a short movie that describes the overall uh, process. 
So basically, you can take any type of tissue, um, and here is a cancer tissue or a tumor sample, let's say. Um, so we cryosection that into very thin slices. These slices are put on barcoded glass slides. So we stain the tissue in order to reveal the, the morphology and the histology of the tissue. So if we go down deeper, we can reveal different cell types within the tissue. And underneath the tissue, the glass slide contains a pattern formation of um, um, clustered um, uh, capture probes. So these um, capture probes, when you permeabilize the cell, um, they can um, hybridize to the mRNA that are located within the cell. Then we perform cDNA uh, synthesis on the array, and we release all the material from the, from the glass slide and analyze all of these um, molecules jointly. So in the sequencing step or after the sequencing step, we can decode the, the gene that we capture and also the barcode referring to the X and Y position of the array. So if we look, for example, uh, gene blue and gene green here, you can see where they are expressed depending on what the barcode they had. If you do it on consecutive sections, you could somehow create a 3D uh, transcriptional map also of uh, gene expression. And here it's only showing two different genes, but we're actually capturing the poly-A tail of the mRNA, so it's a transcriptome-wide approach. Sorry, so yes? uh, when you said you're, um, you're also staining, mm -hmm. what are you, is it like H plus E staining? Yes, so it's hematoxylin and eosin. Um, how, how thin are the... Slides? The tissue sections. Um, so usually they are 10 micrometers. This also depends a little bit on what tissue uh, we look at. Um, but usually we start with 10 micrometers and then we like go up and down a little bit to see like if we can get more information out of it. Um, but 10 micrometers, it's, it's almost like a monolayer of cells. Um, and yes, we perform hematom um, hematoxylin and eosin staining, and which is used by many labs. So I think many are, are um, know, know these types of uh, staining methods. But I think also that you can use other type of stainings than just um, hematoxylin and eosin. Yeah. Mm. If you're interested to stain in, I don't know. Some markers. Yeah. Like immune, mm. type, immune type markers. Mm. Right? Yeah. Yes, I think that will be possible. Um, yes. So these are the glass. Uh, these are the barcoded uh, glass slides. Um, they are constructed with six subarrays. So if we look deeper into one of these subarrays, they contain 1,007 spots. All of these spots. Contain, um, contain millions of DNA probes, DNA capture probes. Um, and they all have their specific barcode defining its X and Y position of the array. Um, these spots have the, the size of 100 micrometers center, um, from, uh, in diameter and 200 <coughs> micrometers center to center. And as you see, they all have their own particular ID so that we know uh, where the gene expression originates from. So this, um, as I said, each spot contains several millions of DNA probes. Um, so they are attached to the 5 prime end, uh, to the glass line. So they have a free 3 prime end, um, with a poly T capture region that can capture then the poly A tail of the mRNAs. Um, at one end it contains uh, amplification and sequencing handles. And it also contains this spatial barcode that defines the X and Y position. And it also has the, a unique molecular identifier, so we can uh, remove duplicates later on in the protocol. So this is how the, um, how the protocol works like. So the first thing we do is that we slice the tissue and we place that tissue section onto the array. We stain the tissue section with hematoxylin and eosin. So now uh, we see the glass slide like that. If we put it like on the side instead, it looks like that. So we have the tissue section on top of the glass slide. Um, so these refer to all the spots and the different colors here to the different um, 
IDs or the different uh, barcodes. Um, and as you see, we have some regions in the tissue that are very cell dense, and some regions that are very cell, uh, cell um, sparse. Um, and in reality, the tissue section and the glass slide is a lot closer to each other, but it's, it's uh, difficult to write in that way. Um, yes, so next we permeabilize the tissue so that mRNA diffuse and hybridize locally to the array uh, to the capture probes underneath it. Then we perform uh, cDNA synthesis directly on the array. We remove the tissue to expose all the probes. And then we remove, release all the probes from the glass slide and put them down into one single test tube. Um, Sorry. Yes? Mm? Maybe, it's like, maybe it's a really stupid question, but I just don't understand. So like, is it important how, uh, so if there is a cell where, a, uh, where mRNA from a second probe is expressed, mm -hmm. but it happens to be away from where this probe is on this glass slide, will it go there to hybrid? And mm -hmm. is it important how the probes are localized on this glass as compared to how they are actually expressed in this tissue? Which you yeah, yes, I mean, some parts, um, some parts will not be um, um, analyzed because Okay, so this is because there are some there are some some space in between here where you will not get the information from. You will only get the information from these small tissue domains, uh, but not between them. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I have a more technical question. Yes. How the tissue needs to be prepared for it to be put on that glass slide. Um, so the tissue needs to be fresh frozen. Um, so we usually embed it in uh, OCT or tissue tech um, and then you cryosection it. Um, so yes, at the moment we only work with fresh frozen tissue. Uh, the optimum would be also to make it available to FFP samples of course, but it's a little bit more trickier. Yeah. Yes? What is the most uh, limiting element in terms of resolution? Like is it the diffusion of RNA that can go maybe further than expected? Um, no, um, the limitation of the resolution is actually the printing technology uh, or the way we produce the arrays. Um, the diffusion that you refer to now is not that big and I will, I will show you um, that a little bit um, uh, quite soon. Um, but I mean, of course we would like to have these spots as the size of a single cell and make them very close to each other. Uh, those experiments will be a bit more expensive also, of course, um, but yeah, so we are working with these high resolution slides, but with the printing technology that we have used for these um, microarrays, you cannot really make them tighter to each other or even making the spots um, smaller. So, or yeah, it, it, it is a bit trickier. Yes. All right, so we removed the tissue and then we released all the probes um, from the surface and we put them down into one single tube. Um, and then we do library preparation. And during the library preparation, we will select for probes that only contain the, uh, the mRNA. So the final step will then be to add the sequencing adapter to each end and to put it on the sequencing machine. Um, so so uh, in this process, from read one, which starts from here, we will get the spatial information and the UMI information. And from read two, we will get the genetic information. And then we can connect read one and read two to each other. So a simplified um, count matrix, or like uh, what, what, it, what it looks like usually, um, uh, the data that you get out of these experiments, um, is that we have a barcode and then the barcode has the X and Y position of the array. And for each barcode, we have all the genes that we can find within that particular spot and the count for each of these genes. So for example, this coordinate 13, 26 could maybe refer to this particular position in the tissue. So you can connect, go back and see exactly what cells or what it looks like um, within that region. So, 
you wanted or we talked a little bit about um, um, diffusion of transcripts because the spatial transcriptomics technology is kind of dependent on vertical diffusion. If we have uh, horizontal diffusion, all of the mRNAs from all the cells will be mixed up and we will lose the point of doing spatial, um, um, doing spatial analysis. Um, so this step in the protocol is quite um, um, critical. So for different types of tissue, we need to do different types of polymerization treatments. So every time we start working with a new tissue type, we need to tweak the parameters for the, um, for the permeabilization step in order to get the right conditions um, and not make the mRNA diffuse too much. Did I have a question? Yeah? Yes, maybe I missed it. What's the size of the spot? The spot, the yes, so the spot of the size is 100 micrometer in, um, um, from, um, uh, in diameter and from center to center it's 200 micrometer. Yes. So how do we uh, evaluate that we don't have um, horizontal diffusion? So we do that by uh, working with other types of array that does not have a spatial barcode, uh, but they still have a capturing size, site. Um, and we, um, we coat uh, these glass like uniformly with, the, with these capturing probes. And during the cDNA synthesis, we introduce um, fluorescently labeled nucleotides. So when we remove the tissue and then look at it um, in a microscope, um, we can actually see the cDNA footprint. So, so this is basically gene activity that is captured on the surface. So it's not tissue. Uh, the tissue has been removed in this picture. And you can see that the morphology is kept very, very nicely. Um, yes, um, there are some leakage on the sides and sometimes we see that um, and, uh, and we think that it can be because during the sectioning um, some of the cells are disrupted that are uh, in the outer part of the tissue. But the thing is that usually we don't see any diffusion uh, within the tissue. So we are quite certain that we don't have any diffusion. Yes. So during the development of the spatial transcriptomics technology, we worked a lot with, um, with the mouse brain, um, or sp more specifically the, uh, the, the forebrain of the, um, the forebrain of the mouse olfactor bulb is called. Um, so this, uh, this is involved in the perception of odors and transmission between the, the, the smells, um, transmitting smell information to the, to the brain. Um, and this is a great model system to work with. First of all, it has a lot of different layers with different gene expression patterns. Uh, and secondly, it, it, uh, it has been extensively analyzed before. Uh, and there is a reference database called Allen Brain Atlas uh, that contains in situ hybridization um, from a lot, a lot of genes. So it's very nice to compare with. So for example, if we look at three genes that we know are specifically expressed to certain layers within the mouse olfactory bulb, um, we can see that we capture that expression with this technology. And if we compare it to the Allen-Brayen atlas and the situ sequence or in situ hybridization, um, they correspond very nicely. So for example, this KCTD12 gene on the outer part and also Within this pear shaped uh, structure, we have pink, and that is also confirmed by in situ hybridization. Yes. All right, so um, this very, very thin line that surrounds the pear shape is called MCL, uh, mitral cell layer, and the layer next to it uh, is called GCL, the granule cell layer. So if you put that on mine, I will show you this now. So if we go back to this diffusion issue, um, so we know that there are some genes that are particularly expressed in the mitral cell layer, this round circle around the pear shape. Um, and we could actually distinguish some of the spots that were placed directly onto this uh, mitral cell layer. So we compared that to spots that were located next to it. Um, and we could see very low expression of those genes um, within um, um, that should be 
um, more expressed in the mitral cell layer. And also we um, confirmed it by using um, laser capture micro dissection, which I told you about before, where we cut out regions that had um, the size of 100 micrometers and we compared it and we got a similar expression pattern from LCM compared to spatial transcriptomics. So there have been a lot after this paper in science two years ago. We have had a lot of publications after that. Uh, and all of them have been um, on new tissue types, um, mostly. Um, so, so this technology can be applied to a wide type of tissues. And there are a lot of preprints out there as well. Uh, and one of these preprints is chasing tissue expression autonomy by spatial transcriptomics, the convolution that Jonas will talk about after me now. I also want to mention that we have a web page, our research group. Um, so if you're interested in using this technology, um, we also arrange tutorials and workshops in our lab. Uh, so you can come visit us and we can teach you the whole protocol. Um, if you want to do it at home, we also have these YouTube movies, so you can look um, to see how, yeah, how you actually do the whole protocol in the lab. How much time do you have left? Five minutes, okay. Um, yes. So maybe I, maybe I will not tell you the whole story about this study, um, but I can show you one. Let's do this. Um, I show you some, some uh, slides. Oh, here, yeah. Um, so in this study, basically, uh, we looked at human um, developing hearts. Um, so we performed the spatial transcriptomics on one heart, and then we performed single, se uh, single cell sequencing on another uh, heart with a similar, at a similar developmental age. Um, since spatial transcriptomics doesn't have spatial resolution, we thought that combining these two technologies could be a great complement to each other. Um, so this plot here, uh, represent the, the, the single cells, and this plot here represents spatial transcriptomics data. So this is a cryosection of a, of a heart. So you see the ventricles, the atria, and then the outflow tract out here. Um, so these are some, some examples of gene expression that if you compare single cell data with spatial transcriptomics data. So high, red means that it's highly expressed, and gray means that it's low or not expressed at all. So if, for example, if we take a gene, um, uh, the myosin heavy chain 6, for example, that is a marker for archer cardiomyocytes, we can see that they are connected to that particular part of the tissue. Um, and also myosin heavy chain 7, which is a, yes? So just when you say you combine these two mm -hmm. technologies, so that means you also have to somehow decide where you take your sample for single cell. Where, where especially were the single cells yes. collected? Yes, um, so the single cells were collected from the whole heart, basically. Um, and then, or, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Um, yes, and then ventricle cardiomyocytes, you see that they are more expressed. Um, that gene expression is more towards the ventricles, and the same with osteoglycin towards the outflow tract, and then that there are I mean, uh, a lot of different cell types here that are uh, expressed in the same gene. But what is really interesting here, what I found in this data, is that if we look at two of these um, uh, transcription factor examples, if we look at in the spatial data, you see that that gene expression is located towards the outer part of the heart. And if we look at the single cell data, there are different subsets of cells that are expressing those cells, uh, those genes, meaning that we have a lot of cellular heterogeneity to a very, very narrow spatial area. And if we combine this with in situ sequencing, which I told you about before, where you perform sequencing directly on the tissue um, that has even cellular or subcellular resolution, then you can distinguish these two patterns a bit more, but, it's, uh, but they're still located towards the outer part of the heart. Um, 
Yeah, I think that I will. Um, I will probably stop there and say. Oh, yeah, because now it's like 10 to. Do I have? Yeah, okay. Um, yes, thank you very much. And um, let me know if you have more questions. So either ask me now or ask me afterwards. I'm happy to answer them. Mm? How many actual copies do you need in order to have an effective barcoding? Like if, if we had a mm -hmm. way of making spots smaller, mm -hmm. you know, eventually they wouldn't have many molecules of them. Like how many copies of, let's say, the barcode? Of the, you mean of the capturing probe that is yeah. attached to the surface? Um, I mean, basically you need a lot more than what you will actually capture uh, the number of transcripts that is about that particular uh, area. Um, right now, there are more than 200 million uh, DNA probes, and if we have, like, let's say, uh, 10 to 40 cells, and if every cell contains, I don't know, 300,000 transcripts, so it's more than enough to capture all of these transcripts. Um, but, um, I mean, the sensitivity is like basically like a single cell um, that you don't capture all of them. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. So um, I was wondering, so. You the location, as I understand it, is basically based on a spot. Mm -hmm. Would it also be possible to barcode actually each probe differently? Is that possible from the space of the... You mean within one spot? Yes. Um, so now uh, we we pre-designed the, the barcode so we know exactly uh, where, where that uh, particular barcode is located, but within that spot, the UMI is different between all of them. Uh, and they are... Uh, they are produced in a random manner, so you can't really say like where where they originate from. Not producing randomly, but basically mm. based on the location. Mm. So you would get a higher resolution of the location. Yeah, so yeah, and then you would need to maybe decode the exactly there. The location, yeah, that would be possible. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to go on 3D with this approach? Um, yes. I didn't show you now, but. <laughs> So we sectioned actually the heart in in, um, in different sections throughout the heart, and we could even like add a lot of more um, more sections into it as well. But we put it into a scaffold resembling the, the human heart, um, so that you can see like where we get the information from, um, the spatial information from. Um, so you yes, if you use consecutive. You don't really need consecutive sections, but you can have some space in between also. You could construct a 3D model of it. Yes? Can I ask? Mm -hmm. What's the estimated cost of that experiment? Oh, um, <laughs> of making a 3D map? Um, so I. Um, it's not really my job to <laughs> take care of like how much the <laughs> the the experiment, the experiment cost, um, but yeah, I mean, it's not it's not for free. <laughs> it yeah, it it costs a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So thank you mm. very much. Uh, let's thank the. Mm? Speaker.